Our scripture reading today is from Colossians 4, 2 through 6. There are Bibles on the end of your pews. You can follow along uh, in there, uh, or you can follow along with us on the screen. If you don't have a Bible, we would love for you to take that home as our gift to you. Uh, And if there's not one on your pew and you would like one, uh, please see our welcome team. Colossians 4, 2 through 6. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open us, open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Well, if you've been tracking with us uh, at all for the past few years, uh, you know we've been seeking God for a building and uh, asking that he might give us a permanent space that we could sink roots here in Silver Spring uh, for generations to come, that we could uh, share the good news of the gospel, that we could uh, care for people uh, in Title I schools and and refugees and vulnerable children and all these different uh, ways, that, that the good news of Jesus would keep going out for generations through our church. And this is a critical Sunday for that. Uh, we're in conversations with a local church that uh, they're uh, considering uh, selling their building and selling it to us. So um, we're just going to take a, a knee if you're able to or uh, willing to this morning. Would you just kneel with me? We'll, we'll pray about this. Their uh, congregation is discussing these kinds of things and making important decisions that relate to this uh, today. So... Uh, Let's come before our God together. Let's come before our God together, and let's pray. Uh, Let's just pray that he might open up a door that uh, this uh, building would be sold to us, that the congregation that's there now would have continuity and stability in that space, that uh, we would also at the well get to see our roots sink deep here for generations of gospel work, of caring for this area, seeing people come to know Christ, and planting churches. So, Uh, Let's come uh, out loud all at once, uh, talking to our God in prayer and ask him to do this uh, and lay this before him now. Let's pray out loud all at once uh, and he will sort out our prayers this morning. Let's pray now. Uh, Father, we have seen you move in miraculous ways every moment when space is needed. Whether it's a basement in the uh, Woodmore neighborhood that we could begin gathering as a few people to start the well together. Uh, Whether it was free space at Riderwood when we didn't have any money to pay for space, you gave us space there. Then opening up the SDA here that we could worship in the annex building and then in their main sanctuary as we are today. Father, we, we have seen your grace, your sovereignty. At, in very particular moments, you've just shown yourself abundantly sovereign, good, gracious to provide for us, your church, at every step. So God, it's with great confidence that we come before you now that if you would give us this building, we would rejoice over your sovereign and generous provision for the sake of the gospel and for your glory. Oh, what a story it'd be to tell, God, of your grace and your sovereignty. And God, if you, you don't, if you don't, we trust you. We, we, we're gonna keep following you. We love you. Wherever you are and wherever you have us, uh, we're gonna follow you with the good news of the gospel here in Silver Spring and the surrounding areas. So we trust you in that too. But God, we pray, we pray you would give us this space that we would get to see the gospel go out for generations, it would create stability and continuity for this existing congregation there, and that you would do a mighty work for your own glory, your goodness, that many would come to know you and enjoy you and follow you with their lives, and that many would be blessed by our church for generations to come here in this area. We're so grateful that we can trust you in this. 
like every aspect of our lives where we lay our prayers before you, we know your answers are good. We know you're with us. We trust you and we love you. You're our God. Building or not. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, we will continue to figure out space on Sunday morning uh, through the summer. Uh, we know some of you travel through the summer, so uh, if you don't have a trip planned, please plan one so we can make some space in here. Uh, <laughs> and you can get some rest. Uh, we'll open up the balcony and things like that if need be uh, over the next few weeks. So. Uh, we're in Colossians. We're coming to a close in Colossians. We have this sermon and next week's sermon uh, out of chapter 4. And we're in this point in the book, this inflection point, where uh, chapters 1 and 2 have hit chapters 3 and 4, where in chapters 1 and 2 we had all these kind of ethereal and massive kind of in-the-sky ideas, these doctrines of who Christ is in his supremacy, his majesty. And we kind of ogled at him and said, wow, what a God we serve. What a savior we have. Uh, He is mighty and majestic. What a God. Uh, And then the ethereal uh, comes down to earth, the brass tacks, the nuts and bolts uh, in chapter three when he says, man, your families live for him this way and your workplace live for him this way. And he gets very specific, Paul does, in chapters three. And now he's gonna kind of back out a little bit and get a bit more general in chapter four. And we have this passage which which hones in on this prayer for open doors for the gospel. Open doors for the gospel. Uh, Paul prays, uh, uh, would, would you pray, church and Colossae, that, that God would blow the doors open, that, that the good news of the gospel would spill out into your neighborhood? into your family, into your county, into your country, that that the good news would flow through these open doors which are now open because we have come before the throne of heaven and prayed, God, open the doors. Your problem, my problem often though is as he opens the doors, uh, we don't open our mouths. Right? Isn't it hard? We, we, you know, uh, we want to share about who Jesus is. We, we want to talk about him in our lives, but, but sometimes we just don't know how to do that. And how do you move from talking about football to talking about faith? <laughs> Uh, how do you move from talking about politics to talking about Jesus? Uh, how do I uh, walk through these open doors and, and talk about who Christ is? Uh, so this sermon uh, is going to be a sermon out of the text, but it's going to be extra nuts and boltsy, very practical, very brass tacks uh, on this idea of, well, how do I talk about Jesus? I, I want to talk about Jesus. I, I want to step through the open doors in the way I talk and the way I walk, but, but how do I do this? Uh, That's why uh, this morning, the Church of the Holy Handout, you have a handout. (laughs) Uh, I almost brought the overhead projector out. I was an English teacher for a little while. Uh, We have a handout here, and uh, we're going to walk through it. Uh, If you don't have one, if you don't have one, please uh, raise your hand, and the welcome team is going to, Abby needs one up here. Welcome team is going to, we need one here for Darren. Uh, Welcome team is going to get these around to you. If you don't have a pen, make sure you have a pen as well, uh, because we want to talk about Jesus. The question is often, how do we go about doing so? We'll go through the text, we'll get really practical on this idea of pray, walk, and talk in and through the open doors that God gives us by His grace. So before we get into the how, it's really important we talk about why. Why do we want to talk about Jesus? Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 14 captures this kind of nugget, the core of who Jesus is, the core of the message of the Scriptures, the core of Christianity in chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. God made us alive together with Christ. Having forgiven all of our trespasses, canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. 
He set it aside, nailing it to the cross. See, uh, this is the core, the center of the good news of the gospel. This is the why we want to talk about Jesus, right? If, if you're a Christian, if, we, if you know who your Savior is, who Jesus is, and what He's done, this compels us, uh, the love of our Savior, the love of Christ compels us to want to talk about with our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends, about who He is and what He's done. The, the why behind the how is, is who Jesus is and everything about him and everything he's done for us, captured in this verse and many verses in the whole story of the Scriptures. We were alienated. We were orphaned. We were rebels. We were outside of a relationship with the living God. There's this, there was this record of guilt in our lives. Man, I felt it even this week, even last night, the guilt in my life, my, my thoughts, your thoughts, your motivations, the, the things you say and don't say, this, this record that if, if everyone could see the sin in our lives, we'd have no friends. And God sees it all. And even the unseen He knows. And not one of us is righteous not one of us holy me you the record of sin is massive in our lives but then what's the verse say but he canceled that record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands how did he do it he nailed his son to the cross he said the righteous one who has no list of sins the righteous one who is pure and holy and good and never has done anything wrong never thought anything wrong never uh, never every time there was the good to do in front of him he stepped right into it and did it and when he did the good his motives were always pure that son, the righteous one, was nailed to the cross in your place and in my place that we could be welcomed in as sons and daughters. That though we're rebels, that though we are orphaned, uh, God would welcome us in saying, I forgive you of your debts. I forgive you of your sins. Why? Because the father has nailed his son on the cross in our place. The wage is paid. We are forgiven. And he welcomes us in by grace. Jesus' righteousness is gifted to us by faith. We just receive who Jesus is and what he's done. And you and I are sons and daughters. Come on in, pure and blameless. What a good news we have. Changes everything about our lives. So much so that might we not keep our mouths shut. The biggest silencer, I think, for Christians, uh, for me, is, is a problem of love. It's a problem of love. I don't know and love my Savior uh, deeply deeply. Because if I knew and I love him and all he'd done for me, man, you'd have to tell me to shut up nonstop in my life. I'd always talk about him, right? I, I, politics, wonderful, but how do I move this conversation to who Jesus is? Football, great, but how do I uh, bring this conversation to faith? I want you to know my Savior whom I love. See, there's a problem of love in our lives. Uh, Paul will say in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, the love of Christ compels me. Now, it's not just a problem of love for our Savior Jesus and knowledge of Him. There's also a problem of love for my neighbor, my coworker, my friend. We don't know names and stories and backstories and the way people are suffering or how lonely they are with a depth of love that turns on our soul in a way we say, I gotta tell you about who my Savior is and the purpose you can find in Him, the peace you can find in Him, the life you can find Him in, the way that He washes away your guilt and sin and draws you in as a son or daughter. You gotta know about my Savior. And you might be here this morning and you're, you're not a Jesus follower. And this, this is kind of exactly what you hate about Christianity. <laughs> You're like, oh man, these Christians just kind of pounding Bible thumpers, uh, condemning me for my morality. Uh, uh, these Bible thumpers always trying to force me to receive Jesus. I, uh, these are the people I, I can't stand. And maybe you have interacted with some Christians who, who've, who've thumped the morality of Jesus prior to just introducing you to who Jesus is and his love for you. Or maybe you've been condemned or judged or or maybe somebody softly and kindly did just share Jesus with you and you rejected him, and that angers you. Uh, this morning, I want to say, man, man come meet the Savior. <laughs> and, and know that if a friend who knows Jesus is sharing with you and you're not yet following Jesus, it's, it's most likely, I pray and I hope, that it's because they love Jesus and they love you and they want you to know him. Uh, 
But believers hate this message too, right? Uh, this idea of go out and share the good news of the gospel, right? Believers hate this message too, right? Because we look at our own lives and we say, ah, oh, shoot, you might already be feeling it. I'm not sharing with anybody. And when I do share, it stinks. It doesn't go well. I'm not good at this. I'm not gonna do this. And, and you have this guilt about, oh, shoot, Pastor Matt's gonna tell me to tell people about Jesus. No way, I haven't done it. Or maybe I'll do it this time. I'm gonna buck up and get it. But you just feel guilty about it. What, and can I tell you this morning? If you never share the good news of Jesus, he still loves you so deeply. He embraces you. He wants you as a son or daughter. He loves you so deeply. That's the good news of the gospel. It's not by anything you've earned or how well you've done to share the good news or, or the evangelist that you are, but that he loves you so deeply and welcomes you in as a son or daughter. If you never share with your neighbor, your coworker, and friend, still, he loves you. And for young believers this morning or somebody who's never done this, uh, here's what I would say. Uh, when you begin talking about Jesus and finding ways to share as God opens doors and, and, and you talk about the Savior you love with people you love, wow, just wait. I mean, hang on. <laughs> It gets really fun. A friend who's been following Jesus for a long time is doing this more intentionally in his life. And the way he talks about it, he's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe what the Lord is doing through me already. You'll get to know your Savior even more as you share about him. You get to see him do things in your life and through you in ways you never could imagine. As people come to trust him, as people hand their lives to him, because you spoke up and you loved and you shared with them. It is a ride that is so fun. Let's get in then, that we've talked about the why, behind why we share, let's get into how we share. Uh, Paul is uh, talking to the Colossian church here. Remember, he's in jail. He's in a Roman jail. He's writing this letter along with Philemon and Ephesians. He's sending that out uh, with uh, Tychicus and Onesimus, and they're bringing these letters to this young church in Colossae. As he uh, gets into this passage, uh, he says, uh, what I want you to do is he's kind of generally talking about the brass tacks of life following Christ. Now as he backs out towards the end of his letter, he says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the word. So here's what he says. Uh, I, am an, I was an English teacher for a few years, and, and he starts with, I, I would have kind of gotten out the red pen here and circled or crossed out and said redundant. Right, continue steadfastly. He's just redundant right there. Continue, which is the same thing as remaining steadfast over and over. Uh, uh, keep praying over and over in your life. Keep coming before the throne of God. Continue steadfastly. Hold on to prayer. Talk to God over and over again. How are you to do it? Being watchful in it with thanksgiving. In your continual, redundant, uh, persistent widow kind of prayers, uh, be watchful. Uh, this is the idea of expectancy. Uh, both for the answers to our prayers, right? we pray to a God who answers prayers, be, be watchful, but when this phrase is used, uh, particularly in 1 Peter and a whole bunch of other epistles, uh, uh, we, the idea of being watchful is to have our, our eyes in the sky, in a sense. Like, I know he's coming back. And as I pray, I pray he answers this prayer uh, even before he returns and I'm just waiting eagerly, watchfulness for his return. But in my watchfulness, as my eyes are in the sky and, I, and I'm praying for him to do things in the lives of, of people I love and people I know and in my workplace or in my own heart and character, I know he's gonna return, I'm expectant of that. Uh, at the same time, I'm not just watchful in the sky for his return, I'm watchful in my own life. This is what this phrase uh, captures over and over again in the scripture. I'm expectant in his return and therefore I want to live a certain way as I wait for him to come back. 1 Peter 4, 7, I'll put it this way. Uh, the end of all things is near. So be self-controlled and alert so that, so that what? That you can pray. Isn't that crazy? The end is coming, so be self-controlled and alert so that you can pray. And then he talks about this idea of being watchful in our own lives as we wait for his return and are watchful in the sky, that, that we would live a certain way that glorifies and honors him. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says this, as he's talking about a prayer in the community, and, and some people are saying, oh man, your God is delaying. He's so slow. Actually, he's never coming back. 
2 Peter 3, verse 9 says, Our God is delaying, though we're expectant for his return. Why? Because he wishes that none would perish. Our God longs to draw people to himself. He wishes that none would perish. And when we come before him in the throne of grace continually, steadfastly, what we ask of him is, God, would you rescue my son? Would you rescue my daughter? Would you rescue my friend whom I love before you return? And God, would you transform me that I live a faithful and honoring life to you before and as you return and as you come back? How do we do this? With watchfulness and covered in thanksgiving. Being watchful in it with thanksgiving. That we know our God is pleased with us because of the grace of Christ and we can look around at his great blessings in our lives and say, oh God, I love you. You're returning not to judge me, but you're returning to embrace me by your grace. Would you embrace these around you and would you transform my life? I give thanks to you. And then Paul hits kind of this main idea, which is uh, coloring the whole passage. He says, at the same time, pray also for us. In your prayers, uh, pray watchfully and with expectancy of Jesus' return. And pray also for us that God might open to us a door for the word, the gospel, to, to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, Paul says. Pray that the, the doors would be blown wide open. Now this is amazing because Paul is in prison. And here's what he's not praying. Pray that you would throw these prison doors wide open. Isn't that what you'd be praying, what I'd be praying? Change my circumstance. This stinks. But Paul has this uh, understanding of all of eternity with the return of Christ where he says, don't blow open the prison doors. Blow open the gospel doors. I want to get the good news out. I want to see eternity changed in my friend's lives. I want him to have the purpose that he finds in only you. I want him to be uh, quenched his uh, anxiety and given security in only you. I I want you to be made known. Would you blow the doors of the gospel open even if you keep these prison doors shut? So us, uh, how, how are we praying? What are we praying for uh, in preparation for Jesus' return in watchfulness? What and who are you praying for these days in preparation for his return? I, uh, this is a, a friend of mine I've known since third grade. He, he, uh, he wrote me this email uh, back in college years ago. Uh, he, he went on to... Uh, Man, Mary, an amazing woman, uh, works in international business now. I mean, he's like cream of the crop, tip of the top. And he writes this email, and I, I chopped a piece of it out. I chopped a piece of it out. Uh, he's talking about all the amazing things he has in his life. And he does. He's got amazing things, tons of blessing, right? He doesn't yet know Jesus. Uh, still today, uh, 45 years old, and he writes this in his email. He says, nothing else has seemed to work. And I chopped it out. I just put it on this little picture of this cross I took uh, years back. And uh, th- this is what this is a reminder of for me. Nothing else has seemed to work. He has it all. And we're surrounded by folks. They've got it all. But nothing is seeming to work. For the deepest core desires of their mind, their heart, their souls, nothing is seeming to to work. And so over and over again, I, I come before the throne of grace to say, Lord, would you save him, Matt? Would you save him? Because nothing else works in life. And I've got a friend uh, a few years back. He, he came to trust in Christ, sorting things out, and he's praying day in and day out for his wife. God, would you, would you draw her to yourself? Would she, would she know who you are and your love for her? Man, would you transform her life? It would make all the difference in the world if she embraced you. God, would you do it? Maybe you're praying for your daughter or your son or a co-worker or a friend. Uh, j- just yesterday, so uh, uh, lived in this house for 10 years now. Uh, my neighbor comes over. He's recently been uh, holding my hand. Like yeah, This is weird. I said holding my hand. It's weird. Here's what happens. We'll, we'll be talking, and then uh, we'll be sharing about something going on. He'll say, Matt, let's pray. And I'm like, 
All right, let's pray. So we hold hands, and, and this kind of faith in his life has gotten really vibrant. And, and we talked about Jesus some, but here's what had happened. I've been praying for him for years. Uh, he got plugged into a different church in the area. And first of all, as a pastor, I'm like, that's a little offensive. You know, I'm leading a church right down the road, right, under Christ. And uh, so at first you're like a little hurt by that. And, but here's what's happened. His faith is growing like crazy. And so yesterday he goes, he literally says yesterday, he goes, hey, remember how we baptized his son's 30-some years old? And we, he goes, remember how we baptized my son in the kiddie pool in the backyard? We did that. It was really crazy, really fun. Uh, by God's grace, he had come to faith here at the well, his son, and um, he goes, I think I want to get baptized in the backyard in a kiddie pool too. Now, this guy's 60 years old. And I'm like, that sounds awesome. But here's the thing. I've been coming before the throne of grace. I'm sure others have. But, but God in his grace had, had reached down and reached David through somebody else. I love that. It may not be you, but let's come before the throne of grace over and over again for our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends that they might come to know our Savior whom we love because we love them too. So here's the uh, worksheet part. Uh, let's back out of the sermon for a second and think of our own lives. Uh, grab this to whom how sheet. Uh, we're gonna get very nuts and boltsy here. So uh, the first piece is this. To whom will I follow Jesus towards? I, I wanna begin praying for people. So we think about where am I currently placed in time and space or the hobbies, the fun stuff I do, and who are the people in these realms, right? Who are the people there? And, and go ahead and write three names of people that, that God has put on your heart. Now, look, people are not projects. Uh, these, are, these are folks you love or want to grow in deeper love with. These are folks you, you want them to meet Jesus, your Savior. This is no project. This is no... Uh, uh, like uh, think something we have to do. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get them. I'm going to convert them. These are people we know and love that we get in earnestly praying for. R write down some of their names there. I'll, I'll write along with you. And now let's pray earnestly, silently, uh, for these folks that we love and want to know our Savior. I pray by name for them, that God might open doors in your relationship with them or other ways that they might be drawn to this, to our amazing Savior. Father, thank you for these uh, neighbors, these coworkers, these friends, these family members uh, that you've placed us near. Uh, in your sovereignty, you have uh, written out time and space and place and relationships, and you've put us near these folks that they might not be far from you, that you might pursue them and maybe even through us. Uh, God, would you draw these folks to yourself and would you open up doors and moments and conversation or relationship where we might be able to share about who your son is and what a great savior he is. And, and if it's through someone else or something else, God, would, would you open up eyes and, and minds and hearts that these folks would come to know, love, and trust you, God. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. And so what do we do when God does open these doors? What we want to do, we want to walk through them and we want to talk about who Jesus is and what he's done. 
Uh, that's just where the passage goes here, this idea of walking and talking. Uh, uh, the, the talking piece hits in verses 4, and then again in verse 6, the walking's right in the heart of it in verse 5. So uh, you got talking, walking, talking, and what we're going to do, we're going to hit the walking piece right now. Uh, walking towards others and walking in the sort of way that shows off our Savior. And so this is what uh, Paul says in verse 6. He says, walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Walk in wisdom, and, and the way that we walk and the way that we talk is always connected, right? Like, if you're talking one message and you're living another, if you're talking grace and all you do is judge and condemn, uh, if you're talking love and you don't have any relationship of love and sacrifice with this person, our, our walk and our talk, they, they've got to link up. So walking in wisdom is simply, wisdom is this idea of knowing who God is and living accordingly to who our God is, is, is the wise life, walking in wisdom. And also the, the text highlights this idea that we would make the most of our time, making the best use of our time. Why? Because our time is like a mist. Here today, gone tomorrow, James will tell us. Short. Uh, Jesus talks about the, uh, us being in the final, the last days. So, so it's really important that we would walk in a certain way uh, in line with who our Savior is and we would walk towards in proximity those who don't yet know him. Why? Because the time is short. We don't know how long we have with this neighbor, this coworker, this friend before they move, especially in this area, or you move. We don't know uh, how long you or I have before we die and meet our Savior. We, we don't know how long we have till Jesus returns. The time is short. So let's make the most of our time. Now, this is uh, not the first time Paul's used this language in the book of Colossians. Uh, he says the same kind of thing back in chapter 2, verse 6. He says, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith. That, that we're to walk in a way that is like Jesus. In Acts chapter 4, verse 13, uh, Peter and John, they come before this, uh, uh, the Sanhedrin, this power class, the rulers of the time. And Peter and John, they just start talking boldly about Jesus, the way they're living and talking, uh, their walk and their talk, it's matching up. And, and, and these people are saying, hey, you can't talk about Jesus anymore. And they're like, we're going to talk about Jesus. And here's, I love this little phrase in Acts 4, 13. They say, oh, we took note that these guys, Peter and John, had been with Jesus they knew him. They walked like him. They were bold because of him. Or in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, uh, you have this group of new believers in Antioch, and there's this phrase that says uh, they were first uh, named or known as Christians there. Uh, in a sense, uh, those uh, following the way of Christ, uh, little Christ, right? Living like Christ and walking in his ways. And that's actually uh, what the church was first called, like the, the followers of the way we see through Acts. The way of Christ being lived out in these people. Our walk, walking like Christ, and also walking where Jesus is going. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, uh, Jesus comes on the scene and he calls his first disciples to him. He says, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Come along, and where is Jesus going? He's going towards people who don't yet know him, that we might uh, be made into fishers of men with him. He's always walking towards uh, a Pharisee to bring the hammer down and say, you need to trust in grace, not your own legalism and righteousness. He's always walking towards those who know their sin, not to bring the hammer down, but to beckon with grace and say, come on in, you're forgiven. Like uh, He's always walking towards the lost. Might we follow him there as we walk like him? So what is that for you and for me? Uh, what's it look like to walk like Jesus uh, in wisdom in these days as we wait for his return? Uh, I think I'd categorize just in one idea to, to walk towards and to walk with people is this idea of hospitality. Is opening your life up to others is going into the living room, the dining room with others, moving from uh, the workplace the, where you don't even know this guy or gal's name to then knowing their name, hearing a bit of their story, and then opening up your life, them opening up their life, uh, where, where co-workers uh, become John, who drives a Civic and has this backstory, who then uh, become friends who you've hung out with some, who then become family that you're now in a relationship with. Hospitality, opening up our lives. Uh, 
one of my favorite passages is Matthew chapter 9. Uh, Matthew chapter 9 uh, verses 9 and following, we, we see this lived out in Jesus' life. Uh, that he's walking in a certain way, but he's walking in close proximity with folks that you'd say, hey, you ought not to walk with them. <laughs> Matthew chapter 9, Jesus passed on from there. He sees a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me, Jesus said. And he rose and followed Jesus. And where's Jesus go? Look where he goes. As Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors... And many sinners came and were pining with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus comes to seek and save the lost, and he does that by eating, opening his life, and and living in relationship with those around him. Uh, We need to notice first that he's done this for us, that we are those sinners. (laughs) He's opened his life up to, he's given his life for, that we are those sinners, that, that we would then walk with him into the lives of other sinners like ourselves, that we would eat with and open our lives up. Because here's what people want to know. Will you embrace me? (laughs) Will you welcome me and love me and care for me? That's what they want to know. And, and what we see is Jesus is here. He's, he's embracing, he's loving, he's caring for sinners, so much so that the Pharisees are saying, what are you doing eating with them? I was at a great party last night with friends. I don't know if they would have thought he's a pastor. Like, I'm not getting drunk. And I'm being kind and, and seasoning my talk with salt and I, I, I'm opening life up. But, but, but uh, here's the idea. The idea is uh, I want people to know I embrace you. I love you. And then when the conversations come, the second thing people want to know is are you thoughtful in your faith and, and also still humble as a Christian? Uh, people want to know are you going to be judged and shamed or pushed away and, and impressing the morality of Jesus on folks before you invite them into a relationship with Jesus? And also they want to know you have a thoughtful faith and you're not prideful, but you're humble. Uh, so here's how we do this. Let's uh, get nuts and boltsy again. You can uh, grab your sheet out here. Getting closer. How can you increase your physical proximity with the folks that God is calling you into relationship with? How can you increase your relational proximity with these folks? Uh, One of the best ways to do this is to integrate your life, to to bring your Christian friends together with your non-Christian friends. Right, to say, uh, this uh, person here at church, I want you to know this person not at church. Often we'll live, in a sense, like two different friend lives, but bringing those together in proximity, integrating our lives together. How will you increase proximity with those who don't yet know Christ in your life and integrate your life with those who do? Go ahead and write down some ideas. What will that look like for you as you integrate your life? So at this point, we have have prayed God open doors that the gospel might go out, and God is opening doors as we walk like his son towards those who don't yet know him. And and yes, these folks want to know, are you going to shame me? Are you going to judge me? Are you going to embrace me? They also want to know, do you have a thoughtful faith and let your, yet you are humble and kind, but you you thought about, why is this a a logical, uh, coherent faith of who Jesus is and what he's done? Why does this kind of make sense in life? But you know what else they want to know? They want to know the answers to life. (laughs) They want to know, they want to know what is goodness? What, what, is, what do I do with the guilt in my life? They want to know how to wrestle through, man, I'm thinking of getting a divorce. What, what do you think about this or that? They, they want to know how to wrestle through the tough times. They, they want answers, and we, we have answers. We have answers of who Jesus is and what he's done that will radically transform a person's life. I notice the, the ways that Paul talks about how we're to open our mouths then. As we walk through these open doors, living like Jesus and living in proximity with others, he says in verse 3, declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I'm in prison. Pray that I I might declare the mystery of Christ uh, and that I might speak and make it clear as I ought to speak. 
And the first thing we think is uh, declare the mystery. Well, that's exactly why I can't do this. I'm no preacher. I'm not going to uh, stand on the street corner with a bullhorn. Like, I can't do this. But uh, it's a really wonderful word, declare. It's laleo, and it just means to speak. And, and sometimes it means to have small talk. <laughs> it's just kind of across the table conversation, you know, sitting across a coffee and talking in the deeper ways of life and opening our mouths that, that we might make clear who Jesus is and what he's done. This is often where somebody placed their faith in Christ over, over a coffee or a conversation or a fire pit where, where you're just talking about who Jesus is almost in a small talk kind of way. Opening your life as they open theirs. But we're making it clear. We're making it clear of who Jesus is, that he's the way to life, that he's offered forgiveness that we need, that he draws us into a relationship with the living God that we so desperately need. It's very exclusive, but it's, it's entirely inclusive because anyone can come, Jesus says, and find life in him. And in small talk, we can talk about who he is and what he's done boldly and clearly about who Christ is. But, but notice also what Paul says about our speech. He says it in verse 6. Let our speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Not only to be bold and clear in our conversations, but to have tasty speech, seasoned with salt. Uh, understanding how to interact with folks who don't yet know Jesus. Uh, and when Jesus came, he says he came with grace and truth. To have these conversations with folks across the table. Uh, People want to know. People want to know. I've, I, I'll just share some of the questions that folks have asked me as I've had these conversations. How could evangelicals all vote for Trump? They want to know that. And so you get to talk about the difference uh, between what an evangelical as a voting block is and an evangelical as uh, someone who uh, trusts in Jesus and wants her whole life to be shaped by his love and following the resurrected Christ. You get to have those kinds of conversations. Uh, people want to know, uh, what do you think about Leah Thomas? What, what, do, you guys, what do you think about uh, women in sports and, 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 and gender and sexuality? People want to know these things. And we have an opportunity to talk with them about what we think about who Jesus is and what he said and how we're living this out in him. Now, even as I talk about uh, uh, Trump and, and, and women in sports and all these kinds of things, what we immediately are doing, probably in your seat, you're doing it right now. Oh my, I don't want to talk about that. I do not want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about politics. I don't want to talk about the news. I don't want to talk about Jesus. I'm just going to, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> well, here's why I think you want to keep your mouth shut. First of all, there are four main reasons we do not speak up. Love, ability, courage, and guilt. Love, ability, courage, and guilt, why we don't speak up. The first is love. We don't love Jesus like we ought to, and we don't love this person who's sitting across the table like we ought to. And here's what I mean by that. If I love my Savior and how he shaped my life, I'm going to step into those conversations even though they might get messy and ugly. If I love that person deeply, I'm going to take a stab at it. <laughs> Uh, ability, right? Uh, I don't know how to share the good news of who Jesus is and how he interacts with this topic. But, well, I'd say, look, put in the time. Put in the time. We do it all over our lives. Say, you want to become a better father? Well, you put in the time. You want to work out this uh, issue in your own life? You put in the time. You go to counseling. You, you want to do well at your workplace? You put in the time. You, you get better at your job. Put in the time. It's worth it. Uh, even just memorize a couple of a simple, Romans 6.23, just memorize one verse. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Or one of my other favorites, just memorize one verse, John 1.12. Yet to those who receive Jesus, he gave them the right to become children of God. Put in a little time to understand and explain what is true about Jesus. Uh, how about this one, courage. Uh, what if they reject me? Uh, here's the thing. If you're talking about who Jesus is and, and they reject you and they end the friendship, it probably was not a real friendship. Or you are a complete jerk. I mean, that's true too. Uh, but, but also uh, courage, right? Like uh, if you are being silent about one of the most massive pieces of your life, you're not being a real friend either. 
If you think there's only life found in Christ for all of eternity and will either uh, the wrath of God will either be poured on Christ or it will be poured on you and we don't share that. That's not real friendship. Last is guilt. The reason we don't speak up is, oh my gosh, I'm gonna do this terribly or I just, I, I can't do this and, and God's not pleased with me. I'm not gonna talk about this and and we've already said, man, he forgives you, loves you, even if you never speak up. And there's never been a time when I shared something about Jesus and I just thought, nailed it. Never. I've always looked back and said, oh, I should have said this. I shouldn't have said that. Oh, my God. There was this time this guy showed up at one of our Bible studies for 3Ds, and it's his first time there. And I just thought it'd be great to say, hey, I think you might be going to hell. I said that. <laughs> Why would I say that day one he shows up? He never came back. You're like, shocker, yeah. <laughs> Season with salt, grace and truth. Uh, how do we move a conversation from football to faith? Um, uh, let's get out our two home house sheets here and do a little bit of work together again. Because here's the, the joy of this sermon in the nuts and bolts is, is beginning to walk this out in your own life as you move towards those whom you love to share about the Savior you love. How do you go a bit deeper? How do you share, talk about Jesus? The, the first thing you need to say, this is so important, the first thing you need to say in relationships when you're talking about Jesus is nothing. We need to ask questions and listen. And listen for uh, this person's story in their life. And listen for, you can circle this, how is Jesus good news to this person? How is Jesus good news to this person? Listen a lot, share a little. You're listening for, is this person wrestling with security and you know the Savior who brings ultimate security? Are they wrestling with validation they've never felt good enough all the way from their mom down to their workplace now to their grades, all this, but, and, and you know the Savior who brings validation. You're listening for where is the good news to this person? And then to move that conversation as you're listening and you're talking about football or faith and, and politics, how, how do you move it to faith? I'm just gonna give four quick ways and then we're gonna close out and I just say, hey, I commend you for working through the nuts and bolts together in this idea because your life is gonna explode in an awesome way when you begin sharing the good news of Jesus with your neighbors, coworkers, and friends. Uh, four ways to move this conversation. This is just over kind of different years of sharing. And uh, the first is this, uh, their stick, ask, pray, and a platform. So stick, to move a conversation from just politics or football to Jesus. The first is stick in the relationship. Just stick in the relationship over time. If you're loving, the, and you've dropped flags, little hints over time of, I'm going to church this Sunday. They're like, oh, that's weird, you know. <laughs> Uh, my, my flag is, I'm a pastor. They're like, that's weird, you know. But you've got those flags, right? Uh, I, read, I was reading my Bible this morning, right? Like, but you're sticking in the relationship over time, and they know who you are. They know that you follow Jesus. Then when things fall apart, guess where they're gonna go? To you. By God's grace, might they come to you and get to share about Jesus when they're going through that divorce or that cancer or their kid is wrestling with their gender or sexuality. They'll come and talk with you. Stick in the relationship. The second is ask more spiritual questions. This will make you shake a little bit. Now uh, the first, uh, and I would write these down. They're, they're not uh, part of uh, those questions. They're, they're not in that big old paragraph. These are the ones I find to kind of be gold questions. So the, the first is, could I hear more of your story? And look, you're not after converting a person. This person's not a project. Uh, you, you love them. You want to hear more of their story because you know a Savior who brings good news into their story. Could I hear more of your story? A friend of mine was wrestling through cancer and he, he beat it and he said, I beat it. And then I, I said to him, man, I had a, a couple of friends who did way more than you did. They ate more healthy, they exercised more and they're dead now. And I said, I, but I'd love to hear more of your story. It was another one as I looked back and said, I shouldn't have probably said that. But I just uh, I shared that, that question. Can I hear more of your story? And we, we did multiple times, got coffees. I heard more of his story. Ask spiritual questions. Another good spiritual question is, hey, what faith did your parents raise you in? What faith did your parents raise you in? Or, or you might ask it a different way. What's faith or spirituality look like for you? And then here's uh, one I, I say over and over again when I want to share the good news of who Jesus is. I say, 
would you mind if I just share kind of the core of the Christian message? Or would you mind if I share just the core of the story of the Bible? Or would you mind if I just share the core of a relationship with God and how to have one? And then I'll say this little phrase. It, it'll feel like it doesn't connect at first, but then I'll bring it back to what we're talking about. So if the person's wrestling with validation, I, I share the story of the good news of the gospel of a God who's so pleased with us because of the grace he's poured on us, making us his sons and daughters. If they're wrestling with security, I talk about a God who holds our present and our future. How do we know? Because he's rescued us in Christ. Look what he's done. It looked like chaos was ensuing, but he embraced us, made us sons and daughters. Right? Uh, can, would you mind if I share the story of the gospel and then bring it back and connect it with them? Uh, the fourth way to move from football to faith is uh, ask this question. Uh, would you mind if I prayed for you? Would you mind if I prayed for you? And often they'll say, yeah, that'd be fine. Then I'll say, now. Can I pray now for you? And then I'll pray, and I'll pray for them, how the Spirit leads. And the last is create a platform. Create a platform. Uh, this could look like a, a repetitious fire pit where you're sitting around a fire pit together, and, and it's every week you just kind of do that and talk life or ask questions. Or, or uh, uh, one time I asked uh, some guys if they'd read a book about Christmas with me. Uh, another time uh, this uh, book, uh, Pappy Land, the, the story of uh, uh, Pappy Van Winkle and this uh, really kind of uh, a neat piece of bourbon story, and, but the guy talks about some faith and stuff in there. So just uh, create a platform. Uh, this is one of the platforms we found just amazing here is encounters with Jesus. You say to a friend or a couple friends, hey, would you mind uh, or would you want to read a story about who Jesus is? Uh, uh, we've had some spiritual conversations. Would you want to do that uh, a couple times, that kind of thing? I want to commend you. You stuck with me through a long nuts and bolts sermon. Uh, I rest assured, not every one service sermon will be this long. But it is so critical. The time is short. We love our Savior. We love our friends. We love our family members. We want them to know Jesus. Now, would you mind if I share just the core of the message of Jesus with you as we close out here? I'll share it in three different ways. This is the core we remember and, and let it soak into our minds and our hearts. If you are lonely this morning, you have a lot of friends, but you do not feel known. Or you feel like this friend and their rejection or, or you feel even rejected by God and alone. And can I, can I remind you this morning that, that your God, he ran towards you in Christ. You're not alone this morning. He loves you so deeply. He embraces you as a son or a daughter. You feel alone in whatever you're walking in this morning. Can I rest assured you are not, if you're trusting in Jesus, you are not alone. You're a son or daughter. He's with you this morning. Would you embrace him again, being reminded of who Jesus is and what he's done? Way number two. Oh, are you so driven in your pursuit for validation? Man, you are just chasing after this grade or, or that elevation at work or, or this amount of money. Are you chasing it so much that you need this validation that you never had? Would you know you have a God in heaven who looks at you as a son or daughter this morning? He embraces you not because of anything you've done or accomplished or the degree you have or how great your kids are. He embraces you as a son or daughter by grace. You are validated. You're his. Way number three. Are you anxious this morning? Man, you, uh, there's something going on in your kid's life. There's something going on in your bank account or your workplace, and you are just so anxious. Would you know that, man, when it looked like everything was out of control, Jesus came and chased you? And he holds you and he holds your future. There is something in your future. You, you think it's going to all crumble and you'll, you'll be left in shambles. Would you know your God will be standing there and carrying you then too? How do I know that? Because we have a Savior whose body was broken and his blood was spilled for you. Look, we don't have to talk about him. But what a Savior we have. What a Savior we have. And when we fall in love with the people around us, we will want them to know and to meet this Savior we have. If you're lonely this morning, if you're crushing your life in a pursuit of validation, if you're anxious about something in your future, know that you have a Savior. 
Let's take and eat together and rejoice. Oh, what a Savior we have. Let's take and eat.